for our main event, I would like to request my my dear friend, brother Richard Dearborn, na pase season. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. How how is everyone today? Good. Amen, amen. I, I'm really encouraged about the, uh, the Midrash of our men. They are really wonderful. Um, it gives us bits and pieces of good things that will make us ready for the main event. <laughs> and, um, and our topic for today is uh, a continuation of my previous message um, two, three weeks ago, and we are in a series of uh, studying the book of Revelation. But before we do that, uh, let us uh, bow down our heads and pray, and we will seek the guidance of our Lord for, for this message. Avino Malkeno, our Father and our King, we come before you with thanksgiving and praise, because you are the Almighty God, and no one is like you. You're the King of kings, you're the Lord of lords, the Almighty God. You're the creator of all things. For in the beginning, you created the heavens and the earth. And you sustain all things, O Lord. And you will restore all things. Heavenly Father, we pray for your anointing, for your spirit, O Lord, to open our eyes and our hearts that we will understand your message today. Once again, we give you praise, honor, glory, and thanksgiving for you are most worthy of praise. In Yeshua's name, our Lord, our Savior, our Master. Amen. Last three weeks ago, we discussed about uh, a two-part series about the message of the Lord to the seven ecclesia. And we studied about it as to whom the message and as to why he gave the message. So <clears throat> we come to a conclusion that the message was only given to his people, not to everybody else. People can assume that that is a message for them, but if they have ear, they can hear what the Spirit says to the ecclesia. So the message is for the are for the congregation or a specific congregation and the people who are listening, whether they belong to another ecclesia or to an ecclesia that doesn't belong to the Lord. If they have ear, they will hear what the Spirit says to the congregation. Now, what I forgot to tell you is what is his message to the rest of the people. And his message is simple. Come out of her, my people. <laughs> there are people, because what we studied before is that in as much as there are, or there were big congregations during that time, there is, the, there is Rome, there is, you know, uh, there was Alexandria where all the theologians came from. There is Antioch where all the missionaries, or most of the missionaries came from. There, is, uh, there was um, uh, Judea, there, is still, there are people still remaining during the time, um, and, and the rest of the Asia Minor and other parts of like the Thessalonica, the Colos, Ephesians is part of the Asia Minor, but the Philippi, which is not part of that, of the letter. So, those messages are for his ecclesia. The rest, he didn't consider as his, unfortunately. Of course, people will disagree with me. No, it's for everybody. No, it's not. Well, have you um, heard about this, uh, the song, uh, my Diary? So he found the diary. He thought it was, the diary was talking about him, but it was actually talking about someone else. So. He cried at the end of the, the diary. So 
If indeed it is a message for us, then let us listen to what the Lord is telling to the ecclesia. All right? Now, part of that, after the letters to the ecclesia, is now the vision of heaven. Now there is a change from exhortation, now there is a vision. And in many ways, um, when we do evangelism, when we preach about the word, we talk about what is to come and, you know, the dangers of hell and everything, and it scares people, and of course, it brings them to, to the path of life, and they become a follower of the Lord. So it's good, right? But the way the Lord uh, wrote the book of Revelation is that he wrote the messages to whom it was uh, given to, but before all those scary things, he first displayed the beauty of heaven. So it's kind of an inducement telling us what is in heaven. And we will be dealing with Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 to 11 for this particular uh, message, the vision of heaven. This topic is actually, as I mentioned, part of the series, and we already discussed about this. Now, the vision of heaven has been the subject of curiosity of all humans. We all want to know what is up there. Many attempted to reach the heavens from ancient times with the construction of the Tower of Babel, according to Genesis 11.4. Let's do this to reach the heavens. To the present times with the joint space explorations of many advanced nations. We already have a big um, space uh, station, you know, just above the earth. And they have a big telescope. They already sent like missions, like unmanned missions towards the end of the, the, uh, the solar system with a big camera so they can actually see what is even beyond, beyond that. And it is giving um, information about what, is, what, is, uh, what the, uh, the satellite or the, uh, the, uh, the device is seeing from that end. Now, what is really out there? What is really out there? Is there really a place called heaven? What is it? Where is it? Now, in as much as our scientists are curious about what is out there, most of them doesn't even believe that there's heaven. They don't even believe that, there is, that God exists. And yet, the very thing that they, they look at it speaks for itself. It, the creation of God it speaks about the glory of God. But because of their intelligence, they become so stupid that they don't believe in the Creator. But their opinion doesn't matter. Our opinion doesn't matter. The truth is the truth. The Bible has been very clear that there is such a place called heaven. And the first instance of the word can be found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, as I've been uh, saying all along, there are two ways to properly interpret the scripture. There is a her hermeneutics way, which is done by the Christians, or the mainstream Christianity, which is not bad by itself. And there is also pardes, which is being done by, it's a Jewish exegesis of the Bible. Now, in hermeneutics, um, we have learned that you have to take what the author is thinking, what is the court culture during the time, what do they believe, what their background, and we have to basically put on our shoes to the writer so that we can understand. So in this case, it's Moses. Also, um, there is also uh, symbolism in hermeneutics. So, but in Pardes, you can do the, the Prashat, which is the literal uh, interpretation. Did really God created the heavens and earth? Or it's just a symbolism. Um, and then there is uh, a Rumesh, um, which is um, allegorical, 
and then there is uh, the rest, which is the first instance. What does it say in the first instance? And you have the sod, which is the, uh, the spirituality of all these things. So let's take at the, uh, the, the midrash, or the rest, which is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In this statement, the creation of heaven and the earth, the formless and void earth, was not part of the six days creation as detailed in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 to 31. Obviously, because it has been separate. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the voidless earth, or, or the formless earth, which is void. Then you have the succeeding creation, right? So we do not know uh, when is this beginning, but we know that there is a beginning of this thing. Again, those things that has been revealed belongs to us and our children, and those that were not revealed belongs to God alone. The word heaven in Hebrew is shamayim. Shamayim. And while water is maxim, or no, mayim, that's a typo, sorry. It's mayim in Genesis 1 2. It, it ought to correct. <laughs> um, my computer doesn't like Hebrew, I guess. In ancient Israel, verbal and written communication, mayim, water, must clearly have been pronounced and written as dual, and this practice would have been closely associated with, with a belief that the waters were divided in two as a pair. This idea was popularly circulated in the cosmologies of both the Israelites and their neighbors, their pagan neighbors. The word Shamayim, meaning sky or heaven, which is closely associated with water in the cosmologies and takes the same intriguing dual ending, could be explained in the same manner. A point of interest here is that fact that the words denoting sky in the Semitic languages are all spelled by prefixing the, the sheen to the words meaning water in general. Simply understood, for example, Shamayim in Hebrew or Aramaic and Samu in Akkadian could be seen as a term combining of or one of which and waters. So what they're saying is, in short, uh, heaven or Shamayim is actually a plural of waters. It's like many waters. So one might therefore assume that the sky was one of the waters, or as uh, Gerardo Sachs maintains, since the Hebrew letter Shin placed before the three letter root uh, extends uh, underlying idea to the utmost. Shamayim is the superlative of Mayim, which suggests that there was water above the sky, which was actually stated in, in the creation itself, when the Lord separated the expanse of the water. Now, in Greek, the Greek word for heaven, because heaven is an English word, uh, used by the Septuagint, obviously also in, in uh, Genesis 1.1, is Uranus. So it's, it's almost like the, the planet Uranus. Uh, meaning sky or heaven, was a primal Greek god persona personifying as the sky. His equivalent in Roman mythology was Calus, and in ancient Greek literature, Uranus, or Father Sky, was the son and husband of Gaia, Mother Earth. So you see there the uh, their distorted, um, uh, perverted relationship between uh, a mother and a son who become also the, <laughs> the husband. So it's like crazy, right? Anyway, um, Uranus, Uranus and Gaia were the parents of the first generation of Titans. You know, the Battle of the Titans, the movie, right? Um, and the ancestors of most of the Greek gods, but no cult addressed directly to Uranus survived in classical times. So there is not much uh, information about him or about it. <laughs> the modern English word heaven is derived from the earlier Middle English heaven attested in 1159. <coughs> this in turn was developed from the previous Old English form theophon and by the, 
1,000 uh, of the common era, euphon was being used in reference to the Christianized place where God dwelt. So this is where the actual English heaven, the word heaven came from. Um, so why we do the etymology of this? So that we understand. It's also part of hermeneutic. So the English term uh, has cog uh, cognates in the other Germanic languages, Old Saxon heaven, sky heaven, Middle Low German heaven, sky, or Old Icelandic himin, uh, sky or heaven, and Gothic himins, and those with a variant final dash L whatever. So we see that there is like similarity and how the word English word heaven evolved from the Old English and also was influenced by other um, dialects or languages from the ancient um, nation. The Old Frisian Himmel or Himmel, which is also heaven, Old, old Saxon, Old High German Himmel, the Lord, Low uh, German Himmel, uh, Dutch Himmel, and modern German Himmel, all of this had been derived from a reconstructed proto-Germanic form of her Hemina. In many languages, the word for heaven is the same as the word for sky. So that's why Christianity came to, um, or the mainstream Christianity came to an understanding that the sky that we see is also heaven because that's where the word came from. So they say that's the first heaven. Are they right? Maybe, maybe not. So it depends on how you look at it. And uh, they also say the second heaven is the, the planetary system, the universe, and the third heaven is where uh, the Lord Almighty dwell. So, but they are entitled to their opinion. It's their opinion, it doesn't matter. Our opinion doesn't matter. What is the truth is the truth, right? Now, let us look at the ancient Near East and other pagan beliefs of heaven. In Egypt, in ancient Egyptian faith, belief of an afterlife is much more stressed than in ancient Judaism. Heaven was a physical place far above the earth in a dark area of space where there, are, there were no stars, basically beyond the universe. According to the Book of the Dead, departed souls would undergo a literal journey to reach heaven along the way to which there could exist hazards and other entities attempting to deny the reaching of heaven, and their heart would finally be weighed in the feather of truth, and the sins weighed it down, and their heart was devoured. So that's why the, the pharaohs, when they are being, uh, when they are being buried, uh, it actually brings, he brings with him his uh, servants, the best of men, uh, wealth, food, Everything, his, even his own weapon, because he believes that when he travels, he got companions too. <laughs> and he's going to go for, to fight. That's their belief system, right? So I, I want you to, to appreciate this. The belief of the ancient, whether they, they actually sustain the modern belief system or the modern thinking of the people compared to the ancient belief system of Judaism and of the Bible, whether it passed the, the intelligence and the scrutiny of the present time. So the Egyptian belief doesn't pass. It's gone, right? It's, it's crazy. Why would you kill your servants? And, you know, they're alive. You just want to bring them with you. <laughs> and bring all your wealth to and then cover it. You know, it could have been given to your successors, right? So it doesn't work. Now, the Canaanite and the Phoenician views. Almost nothing is known of Bronze Age, which is about before 1200 BCE. The Canaanite view of heaven and the archaeological findings of Ogarit have not been provided information. However, the first century Greek author Philo of, ba of Byblos may preserve elements of Iron Age Phoenician religion in his Sakunatayon, Sakunyatron. <laughs> so there's not much information about the Canaanite, and besides, it's very unfortunate for them they had been all killed, <laughs> or most of them. Remember, 
uh, the Lord ordered the children of Israel to utterly destroy them. But, but the children of Israel did not really utterly destroy them, but, you know, the evidence has been eliminated. Um, the Hurian and the Hittite myth, in the middle Hittite myth, heaven is the abode of the gods. In the song of Kumarvi, Alalu was king in heaven for nine years before giving birth to his son, Anu and was himself overthrown by his son, Kumarvi. Now in Islam, the Quran contains many references of an afterlife in the Garden of Eden for those who do good deeds. Regarding the concept of heaven, uh, in the Quran, verse 35 of Surah Al-Rad says, the parable of the garden which the righteous are promised, beneath it flows rivers. Perpetual is the, is the fruit thereof and the shades therein, such is the end of the righteous, and the end of the unbelievers is the fire, according to Quran 1335. Islam rejects the concept of original sin, and Muslims believe that all human beings are born pure, and children automatically go to heaven when they die, regardless of religion of their parents. The concept of heaven in Islam differs in many respects to the concept in Judaism and Christianity. And heaven is described primarily in physical terms as a place where every wish is immediately fulfilled when asked. So it's like there is a genie there, so you wished, right? And, and you have it. Uh, Islamic texts describe immortal life in heaven as happy without negative emotion. Those who dwell in heaven are said to wear costly apparel. Uh, they are very physical, eh? Uh, partake in exquisite ban banquets and recline on couches inlaid with gold and precious stones, and the inhabitants will rejoice in the company of their parents, wives, wives because it's more than one, you know, it's 72, and I'll explain it later, and children. In Islam, if one's good deeds weigh out one's sins, then one may gain entrance to heaven. So it's balancing. So if you did more good than bad, then you're going to go. If not, then you're going to go the other way. What happens if it is equal? You're hanging somewhere. Because it's also a probability, right? I don't know. So the more good deeds one has performed, the higher level of heaven one is directed to. And it has been said that the lowest level of heaven is 100. So for them, there is level 1 to 100. Now, as to why a lot of people, a lot of uh, Muslims are actually doing what they're doing, killing people, innocent people, because according to them, that is one of their good deeds. Uh, to kill an infidel, and that would lead them, that would actually eliminate all their sins, and they will just get, um, get, uh, get into heaven. Now, what is even interesting about that is, if a man has a wife, he will get a wife plus 72 virgins. Uh, they only mention about the 72, 72 virgins because they are more interested of the 72 new virgins rather than their wife. <laughs> so, but if they have four wives, now it becomes even beautiful because each wife has 72 virgins with them. And they will have it for 70 earthly years. Now after that, they will be replaced with if they have four, or they have two, or they have one wife, they will be re they will it they will be replaced with another even more beautiful wife, with an even more beautiful seventy-two virgins. So if they have four, four, four times seventy-two, times seventy years after that, it keeps on renewing year after year. I mean, you know, every seventy years. So that's what they believe. That that's why they can they can kill for this. It's it's. It's a paradise for them, but th that is a different kind of heaven. You know, it's, it's I don't know. Huh? Well, I don't know, but they have, uh, I think they, have, they, they can uh, do something about it, but I'm not interested. Anyway, one is enough. Okay, according to Tibetan Buddhism, so the reason why I'm, I'm giving all this background, so you will ap appreciate why we have what we believe. Why is it logical to believe what we believe? Because unless we see everything else, what we believe is, is, is kind of dogmatic because we don't question it. We have to compare it with other belief systems and whether they can last because 
our, what we believe is also ancient. What these things are ancient as well. And are they logical to be believed in this modern day of thinking? Because now we have more information than 2,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago. So according to Tibetan Buddhism, there are five major types of heavens. So there are five levels. Muslims got 100, right? So the Akanishta or Gana Viha, this is the most supreme heaven wherein beings that had achieved nirvana live for eternity. So nir nir nirvana is actually a state of mind. So they're kind of like, they're out there and they, they don't get to be bothered anymore, right? Uh, whether you touch them, yeah, they're like, they're already perfectly fine. The heaven of the genus, then the heavens of the formless spirits, and there are four in number. So, so there, there are four sub-levels. Now, the Brahma Loka, these are 16 in numbers and are free from sensuality. And the Deva Loka, there are six in number and contain sensuality. So, now, this is another thing that I want to emphasize and remind you. Not only we do the hermeneutics and the pardes, we also use the logical implication. What if they are right and we are wrong? Can we get in? Right? Because if they are wrong, then we know that they are wrong. But what if they are right? So if they are right, we are still okay. Remember, um, in, in Islam, if the more good deeds that you do, the more probability that you're going to go to heaven. Now, for those who, who kill the infidel, uh, they do bad things. They, they normally would, you know, uh, spend time with women and whatever. And then after that, they just blow themselves up, right? So, um, and they, they also drink and whatever, whatever they can do. And then after that, it will all be paid off by one sacrifice, <laughs> killing the infidels. But in fair play, the believers, if you do the commandments of the Lord, you don't harm your people, you give grace to the, to the needy, you help the, the poor people, you visit the sick, you, 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 you're, you're giving good, these are good deeds, even, even in Muslims. So if you do more of this by keeping the commandments of the Lord, if they are right, if they are right, we are still okay. But if they are wrong, they are in big trouble. And we know that what we believe is true. So this one, I don't know. Does it make sense at all? It just doesn't make sense to me. But you know what? If you study the religious uh, beliefs of all the pagans, there is one common denominator, doing good deeds. Doing good deeds. So we have the Messiah. And we keep the commandments. If they are right, we are wrong, we're okay. But they do good deeds based on their own idea. It's subjective. We do the, the good deeds based on the biblical principle. And the biblical principle still passed their good deeds. We're good. So we're okay. What about the Mesoamerican religion? The Nahua people such as the Aztecs, the Chiquimex, and the Toltecs believed that the heavens were constructed and separated into 13 levels. Now it's 13. Each level had from two many lords living in and ruling these heavens. Most important of these heavens were Omeyokan, place of the two, and the 13 heavens were ruled by Ometheol, uh, the dual, excuse me, lord, creator of the dual genesis, who as a male takes the name Ometekotli. Ome or two lord, and as a female, his name Omeke Hual, two lady. The problem: this this religion is now virtually wiped out. So if they are right, so nobody's gonna go to heaven, <laughs> right? So again, it's it's um, it's gone, right? What about the Polynesian Ma Maori Maori? Yeah, their mythology, the heavens are divided into a number of realms. Different tribes number and heaven differently with as few as two and as many as 14 levels. One of the more common versions divides heaven 
Uh, it's, they are saying that Kiko Rangi, presided over by the god Tomau, and Wakamaru, the heaven of the sunshine and rain, and Ngarutu, the heaven of lakes where the god Maru rules, and Haura, where the spirits of the newborn children originate, and Ngatauri, home of the servant gods. Now, you will see all these names, and you will say, I don't care about these names, right? Well, that's right. You don't have to care about this because this is not for us. But I want you to understand something. That behind these names are not empty space. There is always somebody receiving the praises of these pagans. These are the names of the demons. All right? And, of course, um, just like in, in, in what we see, here on earth is just a shadow of what is, of what is unseen, whether in the side of, of the Lord or a side of, of the devil, of the demons. They also conquer one another. They kill one another. Their gods against the gods of this. Don't you think that the demons do not fight against each other? We're wrong. They fight against each other. But what Yeshua said, when the kingdom is divided, they will not stand. That's why they don't stand. Because they are divided. And we will later, we will study that eventually, in the near future, Satan will have to, to relinquish his throne for someone who is even greater than him. Oh, somebody is greater than him? Oh, it must be God. Well, he wants to call himself God. But he's not God. Anyway, that's, that's for the future. But what I'm saying is this. There is one tribe and someone is being worshipped. Now, uh, the demon behind the other one, he said, I'm powerful than you. If you don't submit to me, I'll kill you. But they battle spiritually. They also battle physically. Now they prepare themselves. They go to war. They kill each other. Whoever is the strongest, they win. Is God involved with that? No, it's, it's just among themselves. They just fight among themselves. He, he, he's, his hands off. Those are not his people. They just fight. So they kill each other. Right? That, that's, that's, there, is a, there is a battle. That's why there is a, there is a, we, we hear about people saying there will be one world government, blah, 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 and there will be wars. Why, why is there war? So that one can conquer another. So that he's now the leader, whoever is the leader of that physical leader, there is a spiritual leader behind him too. And if you read the book of Enoch, um, which is another um, uh, an ancient apocrypha, the, the children of the angels, or, or, I mean the children of those fallen angels, which are giants, they, they fight. They, they fought each other, but their fathers, their fathers are behind them. So it's like the battle of the titans, right? So, so when they are defeated, now this guy is subjected to him. It's either he's going to create his own again, his own group, or now he's going to be subjected to this guy because he is now a greater demon. Remember, these are heavenly beings before with, bi bi uh, with big powers. You have to appreciate this because, you know, when you watch the, the, uh, you know, the movies, it, it may be a poor reflection of what is real because it's cinematic, but you can also see what is actually behind it. When, when, see, when they fight against their gods, they break their, the, 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 the idols, and now they put their own god. So when, when Israel was defeated, it's not because they defeated the God of Israel, but because the God of Israel retreated from the Israel because of their sins. Now they get defeated because nobody is backing them up. But when the Lord is there, nobody can fight them. When, when the children of Israel marched from the land of Egypt towards the, towards the promised land, the Lord sent the angel of the Lord, the most powerful one, walking ahead because he will be battling against those gods of the other nations. When you see a bad person out there, it's not only the bad person that you're dealing with, also the spirit behind him. 
That's why we need to pray. When, when, when the believers do not appreciate prayer, you are mistaken. You know why? Because we think that we, we misunderstood the concept that God is in control. Inasmuch as God is in control, there is a spiritual battle there. And when the Lord set up His law, He even subjected Himself to it. Why? Because if not, then He could just have saved us without having the Messiah to die for us. He can just kill everybody and just, come on, I'll take my people. I'm the strongest here. Get out. But that's not the case. Right? When He said you need to pray, we need to pray. Because there are spiritual battles out there. People want to hurt us, kill us, and destroy us. And if we don't pray, we are in bad luck. We just subjected ourselves to the mercy of the enemies who wants to hurt us. All right? Now, these are the rest. I'm not going to mention them. I'm just going to show them. <coughs> now, there are 10 biblical visions of God in heaven. Or oh, there are only 10? Of course. The rest are just, you know, they, the Lord is speaking through the prophets. But there are 10 instances wherein God himself or, or the heaven or the vision of God was shown to people. So Jacob dreamed of a ladder set up on the earth, and the top it reached to heaven, and behold, the Lord stood above it in Genesis 28, 12 to 13. Moses and Aaron, uh, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel saw the God of Israel. Now, I want you to note this. Nadab and Abihu, they saw God. And yet, God killed them in Leviticus 10, 1 to 3. Now, let's open the Bible in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 to 3, because I want to point out something here. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense uh, on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, you know the word strange, as we discussed before, remember? This is meaning it's, it's external or outside, meaning not part of the commandment, right? Strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And the fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. And yet, before that, not long before, they were able to see the Lord the Lord's vision, together with Moses and Aaron and 70 elders. So what does it mean? There are people I know who had experience, like afterlife experience. I mean, uh, near-death experience, I should say. They, they have seen the Lord, and yet they kind of uh, not walking in the path of righteousness. Don't you think the Lord will not kill them? Now, if then, it, then some say, yeah, but it's only the physical body that were killed. We don't know. How did you know? It didn't say. What was, what was uh, said there is the Lord was upset. He killed them. Whether physical, well, for sure, physical is spiritual. We don't know. We cannot assume that they are still saved. Also, salvation can be removed. It's my opinion, your opinion, doesn't matter. That's why Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. If they are right, salvation cannot be taken away. We're all, all of us are okay, right? We're okay. I don't argue with it. I do not argue with people who would say that once you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you are saved. Fine. Perfect. Because I did. Praise God. I hope you're right and we are all okay. Now, what if you are wrong? After you accepted the Lord, you did not walk in the path of righteousness. Where will you go? Check Ezekiel chapter 18. Check Hebrews chapter 9. And also one of the letters. I will not. To those who did not do this, I will not blot them out of the book of life. Whether we can be removed or not, it's better not to assume the wrong thing. It's always good to assume, I mean, the right things. Like, what if this is right? 
then you will not you will be afraid to sin you will be afraid to 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 do strange stuff right you got to be careful and you will have to fear god and then you will live right and for those people who said you know what you have the assurance of your salvation whatever you do you're saved so what's going on with these people they have this they do this they do that they do that and their pastor says like why is why do i have members like this because that's your fault you should have told them to keep the commandments of the lord now i said i said to one of those people that i i i uh, i uh, disciple i train if i am wrong for saying that your salvation can be removed but not like you this you sin you're you're not saved and then you're you repented and then you're saved again it's not like that it's in the end of your life in the end of your life if you are living in sin you're dead now what if you are i am wrong and you believe me and you were so afraid to do sin and you and i'm wrong right salvation when you accepted but that kept you from sinning from the lord right it gave you a good life it gave you a good relationship with the lord because you're so afraid that what if you do not keep the commandments of the lord and you don't stay with him you get to lose your salvation that actually saved you but what if i said oh you know what after you receive jesus christ as your personal lord and savior you're safe no matter what you do you're safe what if i'm wrong and then this guy to did this did that drugs here drug that kill one here rape another and then he said you know what i accepted the lord i'm saved knock at the door i don't know you problem problem but again i'm not going to argue with these people i hope they are right but i will always use the logical implication that if they are right i'm okay if i'm wrong i'm still okay because i keep the commandments of the lord right anyway um moses saw the back of god uh micah saw the lord sitting upon his throne isaiah saw the lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple ezekiel also daniel stephen paul well this is this is very interesting uh whether it was really paul it's an assumption but let's say it's paul okay so to give paul even more credit uh you know because they really love to put so much credit to paul so let's say it's paul um and john right so these are the 10 instances now this is where we're going to deal because we're dealing with with john right <coughs> now i also would like to to uh mention about since we are studying ancient text ancient manuscript from the pagans and from everywhere right let's let's also see the vision of enoch now for those people who may not be familiar with the book of enoch this is what people believe to have been written around 300 bce uh taking the name of a patriarch enoch and obviously it means if if it is a it's a fake so it's a pseudepigrapha it's not even apocrypha but anyway apparently he's a he's a he's a hebrew guy who is really inspired by the lord but he's taking the wrong name he said that i am from so he's not inspired forget about it right but what if he's right now let's forget about what they say let's see what he is about to say about us right but the problem is or not the problem but the good thing is before about 200 BCE up to the first century meaning the time of Yeshua even up to about Antinicene fathers about 200 to early 300 or middle of 300 of 300 AD or of the common era the book of Enoch is actually respected by people it was quoted by Jude it was quoted by James is what it was quoted by Paul is what it was quoted by Peter it was even quoted by Yeshua so something is with this book so why did they remove it from us now in as much as we also read other books let's be fair with Enoch can we let's let's hear what he has to say Enoch chapter 14 and the vision was shown to me thus behold in the vision clouds invited me and the mist 
summoned me, and the chorus of the stars, and the lightnings. I want you to remember these words. Uh, sped and hastened me, and the winds in the vision caused me to fly and lifted me upward and bore me into heaven. And I went in until I drew nigh to a wall which is built of crystal and surrounded by tongues of fire, and it began to affright me. Tongues of fire. We know that during the Pentecost, right? And there, there are walls. And I went into the tongues of fire and drew nigh to a large house. So there's a large house, right? Which was built of crystal. And the walls of the house were like the tasseled floor made of crystals. So there are, the, the floorings are made of crystal. And the groundwork was of crystal. So it's crystal. It's like you're floating, but it's, you're walking actually, right? And its ceiling was like path of the stars and lightning, and between them were fiery cherubim, and their heaven was clear as water. Now, if you are like me who r loves reading ancient writings, you will see the difference of the book of Enoch compared to the writings of the Iliad and Odyssey, of the uh, whatever, the Hinduism, whatever. It, it, you know, you will see the difference. This one is like modern writing. It's like... It's like biblical writing. It's an old, but it's new, but it looks like advanced, right? A flaming fire surrounded the walls and its portals blazed with fire. And I entered into that house, and it was hot as fire and cold as ice. There were no delights of life therein. Fear covered me, and trembling got hold upon me. And as I quaked and trembled, I fell upon my face. And I beheld a vision, and lo, there was a second house greater than the former. So when he got in, there's another one, right? Um, and the entire portal stood open before me, and it was built of flames of fire. See, uh, the portal is like a door. It's like, you know, in the portal of the movies, we see it like a circular one. But portal, the, by the way, the way of the portal, it could be circular, but it could be also rectangular. We don't know, right? Uh, it doesn't say. And in every respect, it so excelled in splendor and magnificence and extent that I cannot describe to you in splendor and its extent. It's beyond description. And its floor was of fire, and above it were lightnings, and the path of the stars and its ceilings also was flaming fire. Um, by the way, the stars in, in the book of Enoch are also the, the, the angels. Um, so it's the path of the stars, path of the angels. And as I looked and saw there in a lofty throne, its appearance was as crystal and the wheels thereof as the shining sun. And there was the vision of the cherubim. And from underneath the throne came streams of flaming fire so that I could not look thereon. And the great glory sat thereon, meaning the Almighty, and his raiment shone more brightly than the sun and was whiter than any snow. Does that sound like biblical? If you, if you know your Bible, you will see all these things. Like keywords, the sun, brighter than the sun, whiter than snow. You can't find that in the description of the pagan uh, writings. They, they are all independent. Like, but they have seen it differently in different times, and yet they're seeing the same things, or, or at least close to it. 21, verse 21. None of the angels could enter and could behold his face. Is this biblical? No one have seen the Father except the Son. That means even the angels cannot see the Father. And Enoch was saying the angels cannot even behold his face. For reason of magnificence. And yet, the Son of Man can come. That's why Enoch in his uh, in, in a later chapter he said, Who is the Son of Man? While all the angels were floating, they cannot even touch ground. But the Son of Man is walking with a head of days. Like, who's that? Because the Son of Man is Yeshua, and be claiming to be the Son of Man caused him to die. And we know that. We discussed that last time, right? Anyway, <clears throat> it's not, he, it, he did not die because he claimed to be the Messiah. He was killed because he claimed to be the Son of Man, and he was asked, therefore, you're saying that you're the Son of God? And he said, yes, I am. Therefore, 
you die for blasphemy. That is in Luke, the account of Luke, uh, during the, uh, the uh, 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 interrogation and, and, uh, and judgment of him. Now, flaming of fire was round about him, and a greater fire stood before him, and none around could draw nigh him. Ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him, yet he needed no counselor. Is that biblical? It, of course it is. It was even quoted by Jude, <laughs> right? And the most holy ones who were nigh to him did not live by night nor depart from him. So there are holy and there are also most holy ones. So not everybody is equal. <laughs> Although they are, we are all dealt with equally, but not everybody is equal. Some are greater, some are less. Those who wants to be greater has to be the servant of all. And those, those who wants to be the least, you know, don't keep the commandments. You will be the least. That's what uh, he said. And until then, I had been prostrate on my face, in verse 24, trembling. And the Lord called me with his own mouth and said to me, Come hither, Enoch, and hear my word. Now, I want you to remember this because we're going re to discuss this also when we come to the passage. Come up here. And one of the holy ones came to me and walked me, and he made me rise and approach the door. So there is a door, and I bowed my face downwards. Okay? So that's, that's the book of Enoch. Uh, first Enoch, actually. Now, according to second book of Enoch, there is a second book of Enoch. Um, there are ten heavens. And I want you to, I'm not saying this is true. I'm not saying this is not true. We don't know. We will know that when we come over there on the other side. But according to Enoch, the first heaven is the clouds and stars and snow, morning dew, blah, blah, blah. So this is what the Christians believe too. So as far as the Christians are concerned, this is correct, right? Second heaven, the prison of darkness, death, and despair, a place of darkness where the angels of darkness who joined with Satan in his original rebellion had been imprisoned, hanging from chains, and awaiting judgment day according to 2 Enoch 7, 1 to 3. Is it right? We don't know. But according to Christian theology, the second heaven is the universe. So have you seen how, the, 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 you know, I think you've seen the, uh, the other planets, how, how bad it is. Like it's either way too cold or way too hot or too dark or the, the, the fumes are really bad. You know, Jupiter has a lot of methane. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just bad. And it's so dark too because they are farther away from the sun. There's darkness. What if the angels of the Lord, uh, I mean those who followed Satan has been kept in here? We know that there are those that were punished by the Lord. We, we know that. In the Bible, it speaks about the beasts. And it speaks about those that were punished, they were thrown out from, from heaven. We don't know. But second heaven, still okay with Christianity. Third heaven, mercy of paradise and justice of hell. A paradise reserved for the good and the righteous, consisting of a fragrant orchard grove with a fiery golden tree of life in the center where the Lord rests when visiting. So, and according to here, um, the Garden of Eden below, there are four different springs flowing with milk, honey, wine, and oil. 300 singing angels stand the garden. So, and in contrast, the northern section is a terrible place of icy frozen darkness with a river of fire flowing through it, inhabited by fierce, cruel angels with weapons who torture those sinners who had been condemned here. Now, let's consider this. Pa Paul said there, he knows a guy who went into the third heaven. And there are ex inexpressible things in there, and he's unlawful for, for that person to actually speak about these things, right? It looks like this is where he came. It doesn't, the, the vision of Paul doesn't conclude that that's where the, the highest heaven. He just said someone went to the third heaven. Remember, Paul is also reading the book of Enoch. So anyways, if he saw paradise and all these things, and it's beyond expression. But it doesn't mean that heaven is only three. Because Paul is not the all in all. He just said someone he knows went to the third heaven. 
But it's not the highest heaven. He didn't say that it's the highest heaven. Right? So anyway, but it's a paradise. He went to the paradise. And according to the book of Enoch, third heaven is the paradise. So he came up to here. So as far as Christianity is concerned, this should be okay. Right? Fourth heaven. Oh, that's not biblical. Okay, that's fine. But, you know, again, we're just reading, right? Let's see. The fourth heaven, 12 gates of the sun and the moon. Oh, why 12 gates? We're familiar with 12 gates in Revelation. Why 12? So th there are also 12, right? Uh, in the pathways of the moon, six eastern gates, six western gates, and the sun and all these pathways guarded and maintained by thousands upon thousands of angels. The sun is escorted daily by 8,000 other stars uh, and needs 100 angels just to light it. And some for the inhabitants include six wings creatures who accompany the angels, exotic rainbow colored phoenixes and uh, Kalkidri with heads like crocodiles as well as armed soldiers who are constantly singing and playing musical instruments. You will say, yeah, that's not biblical. Uh, yeah, that's just strange. But John also saw similar things like this. He even saw like seven heads and ten horns. and Like why can't we believe something and you know, with one we believe and the other we don't. But again, our opinion doesn't matter. The opinion of people uh, that uh, they're saying that uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Holocaust didn't exist doesn't matter. No matter how they tell it, it existed, it happened, right? So no matter how people deny this, if it is true, it is true. If it is not, if it is not, then what, what can we do, right? Anyway, fifth heaven, the giants of silence. Sadness and regret, a sad reformed place of silence and gloom filled with countless number of gigantic human soldiers called the Grigori, who chose Satan as their prince and rejected the Lord of Light. And their faces are withered, but they still remain capable of occasionally singing praises unto the Lord. Enoch 18, 1 to 7. You will say, ha, ah, that's already like uh, impossible. See, uh, they are like, um, see here, um, they are, their faces are withered. Now I want you to open your Bible in, in uh, Hebrews. I want, you, I want to show you something here. The, the Enochian writing in Hebrew. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse, um, verse 10. Let's begin with verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning didst lay the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They will perish, but thou remainest, and they will become old, and they, will, and they all will become old as a garment. And as a mantle, thou will roll them up as a garment, they will all be changed. But thou art the same, and the years will not come to an end. Now, in, in other version, actually, they will be withered. They will wither. They will grow old. So to whom was this mess? Was, who is being referred to here? These are not human beings. Because they could have simply, they will just die and, you know, of course everybody grow old. There's no point, there's no point to argue. But what if it is being referred to the angelic being who rebelled against Yeshua? Because if you study the book of Enoch, you will see there that they don't know who is the elected one. They don't know who he is. And there are angels who were punished because they did not keep his commandments. Now, the mainstream Christianity is holding us, um, unfortunately, is holding us um, uh, hostage to a very limited knowledge of what is happening uh, in, 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 in the heavenly war. Because it looks like only Satan is the all-in-all all of, 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 uh, of, of, of uh, evil things. They believe that, you know, uh, the, the sin of Satan only happened in the Garden of Eden. But it's not only during that time. As a matter of fact, there were angels who, who um, actually um, um, uh, connected themselves with the daughters of men. And it caused them to be punished into the abyss. Right? So, 
There are levels of sin. It was not only one sin, and then that's the collapse of everything. Even before that, there were already angels being punished because they either did not come on their appointed times, another group did they did not keep his commandments. And according to the book of Enoch, many angelic beings were, were put to shame when they realized who the Messiah was or who was the, the elected one because they did not keep his commandments. So, if the book of Enoch is true, the test that the people, we, the test of God to the earthly people when the, when the Messiah came as a human being and people were tested whether we believe in him, were also the same test who were in heaven, the angels in heaven. He was there like boss undercover. So we don't know, right? Again, we don't know. But according to the book of Enoch, it is. So their faces are withered. And that's why here it says, Thou shalt remain, but your enemies will not. They will grow old. They become old. So why is it that who's going to grow old? But it, it was not said that they will die. They grow old. They, they used to be majestic. Now they are withered and they are sad. Melancholy. All right? So this is the fifth heaven. Sixth heaven, archangels of the arts and sciences, traditional home of seven different groups of angels who both rule over the stars, keeping track of their motions. Um, this is the sixth heaven according to the book of Enoch. Again, we don't know how true it is. The seventh heaven, powers and dominions of fire and light, angelic realm of light and fire, filled the many different eternal, uh, eternally loyal soldiers of the Lord, including archangels, virtues, forces, dominions, powers, orders, principalities. So also present are the other worldly like cherubim, seraphim, thrones, and other celestial beings with many eyes. Oh, many eyes. Remember this. Yeah. Along with what the text called the nine regiments. So it does not mean it was not written in the Bible. doesn't mean that it is not true unless the Bible says it is not true. Because the silence of the Bible doesn't mean it is not true, right? So, but we just put it there. We, let's, let's not hold it as, as, as a, like a holy scripture. It's just like an idea. At least we have an idea. It's like a book. Don't use that as like, I, you memorize that verse as if it is a holy scripture. Don't do that. It's just an idea. What if they're right? So at least we have kind of a clue somewhere, right? The eighth heaven, summer and winter of drought and snow, controls the changes, the different seasons of the year, causing either drought or rain or, or the earth and 12 constellations. Ninth heaven, the 12 secret mansions of the stars in the night. Right? The celestial homes of the constellation, the 12 groups of stars. So, and the tenth, the cherubim, the seraphim, and the throne of thunder and lightning. Ooh, I think this looks familiar. Seen as the highest of the heavens as well as the actual location of the Lord God, mighty throne of judgment. Typically, this is where the Lord holds counsel with his angels and saints, making his decisions, handing down his judgments, and commanding his countless angels and surrounding him as they sing songs of praise and glory. Whatever number of heaven is this, this exists, right? So, and it's biblical. We just don't know if it is the tenth. Or it's the 12th, but it's the 10th, right? 10. According to Book of Enoch. I'm not saying it's the biblical truth. What I'm saying is that what Enoch is saying, right? Now, let us examine carefully. That is the introduction. That is the hermeneutics and the pardes. Now, let's go into the message. The door opened in heaven. So, there is a door. There is a door. That's a clue. There's a door. Now, go to um, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, meaning there's a place to enter, right? But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. By the, by the way, the will there, the Greek word is telema, which is actually a decree or a commandment. 
Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. And I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And also the ten virgins, if you remember. They come knocking in the door, right? So there is a door. And it's open. And according to the Ecclesia of Philadelphia, see, I have, I have put an open door for you which no one can shut. And once it is shut, nobody can open. So it's the door to heaven. The second one. You know what? Let's, let's read um, uh, Revelation chapter 4. It's beautiful. Even if we extend a little bit, I think it's, it's worth it. Um, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, like sound of a trumpet speaking with me, Come up here, or come up here, and I will show you what must take place after th these things. Verse 2, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, the throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone, and a sardius in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones I saw the twenty-four elders sitting clothed in white garments, and golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne proceeded flashes of lightnings, lightnings and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal and throne of four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. Verse 7, And the first creature was like a lion, the second creature was like a calf, the third creature was like a face of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings and full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory, the honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders will fall down before him, who sits on the throne and will worship him, who lives forever and ever, and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy art thou, O Lord, and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou didst create all things, and because of thy will they existed and were created. So that's the whole passage. Now let's examine each one. An open door, we have discussed that. The first voice heard was like a sound of the trumpet. So, when, when the children of Israel were in Mount Sinai, there were testimonies that they were hearing thunders. But some are hearing trumpet. But some, very few are hearing voice, a voice. So, the voice of the Lord is like a trumpet. So, when the sounding of the, the trumpet, then we hear, come up here. So, for some, they will just hear thunder. Some will hear it as a trumpet. And how blessed are those who have ear, who has ear, who can hear what the Lord says to his ecclesia. Right? Um, and it says here, the first voice was like the sound of trump the trumpet. So what is that first voice he heard? That is in Revelation 1.10, which says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. Now, again, uh, just uh, um, an addition to here. The Lord's day, the word Lord's day here is the only time that the Lord's day is mentioned. And um, it, in, in Greek, it is actually uh, um, uh, 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 what was it? I forgot. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, anyway, it will come back to me. Anyway, the Lord's Day, they think that it is Sunday. But it doesn't say anywhere that it is Sunday. It just say that it's the Lord's Day. Um, so, um, this, obviously in English, it also means the Day of the Lord. But actually in Greek, it means a day belonging to the Lord. So it's a day belonging to the Lord. Now, which day of the week 
actually belongs to the Lord. There you go. He is. And if you study the word of the Lord, if you study it really carefully, every time he would actually speak to his people, it's always either Shabbat or feast or new moon. Always. That's why when Yeshua was performing every time that the, it's Shabbat, it's Shabbat. Oh, that's why he performed it on Shabbat so, because he's removing the Shabbat. No, he was exactly doing what his father was doing, talking to his people every Shabbat, every feast, every new moon. Check it out. Check it out. So therefore, the most probable day is when uh, it was Shabbat, when, when, Paul, or when, when John was probably in his prayer or in, 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 in worship mode, the Lord showed him, come up here. That's how it is. It's always on the Shabbat. The Lord died on the Passover. He was buried on unleavened bread. He rose on the third day on the first fruit. The Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh came on the Pentecost, on the very day of the Pentecost. What do you think? What will happen next, right? Anyway, um, and also most of, most of the uh, assumption, the word come up here or there, the anabaino hode, uh, is being used by the pre-trib as the prelude that, that's, that's actually the symbolism that the Christians will be called up to heaven just before all these things will happen. That's why it's pre-trib. See, John was lifted up into heaven before all these things happen. But they forgot the idea that so that he can write, he has to be taken up first. <laughs> How can he write something that he cannot see? Right? So he cannot write something that is after the fact. He has to see, he has to go up first before he can see. But that doesn't mean that the pre-trib belief is correct. It has nothing to do with that. He was just asked to come up. Enoch was also asked to come up. Come up here so I can show you what's going to happen. So it was not, right? So, you know, pre-trib. But as I always tell my, my, my pastor friends and whoever, I don't argue with you. I wish you're right. Because if you're right, it will not disqualify me and, 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 uh, and the rest of us who believe otherwise. Because we keep his commandments. We believe in him. We accept, accepted him as our personal Lord and Savior. So why would we be, be why would we be disqualified for not believing a pre-trib rapture? It's not a salvation issue, is it? Then, if it is a salvation issue, then it's not about having personal relationship with Yeshua or Jesus, but believe on the pre-trib rapture and you will be included. Right? It has nothing to do with it. So, even those who don't believe on the pre-trib and yet they have a good relationship with the Lord will be taken up if they are right. But what if they are wrong? Big problem. They are not ready. They thought they can. They don't even study this. So how? Right? Anyway. So immediately, I was in spirit. Right? So meaning, it was not his physical body. And then, behold the throne. There is a throne. Then there is a vision of the Lord. The vision of Elohim. But it's a vision. He did not really see exactly. He did not really see exactly. Because only the Son knows the Father. And only the Father knows the Son. What does it tell you? That's why Paul said, even if an angel comes to you and preaches the different gospel, don't believe him. Because only the Father knows the Son. Now, if the angel would say, you know what? Yeshua is just a man. He's not God. There is only one person God and that's it. You know, don't believe in it. Because it's very clear in the scripture who Yeshua is. We already discussed this before. He, people bow down to him. Angels bow down to him. Which is only to be given to God. But they will say, but the Spirit of the Lord is with him. It's not him that is being bowed to. It's the Spirit of God behind him. Then therefore all people should bow down to us because the Spirit of the Lord is with us also. Peter, when, he, when the Spirit of the Lord was with him, he did not allow Cornelius to bow down to him. He said, I'm just a human being. Do not bow down to me. When John also 
bowed down to an angel. And the angel, the holy angel, is a sinless one. Right? He said, I'm your fellow servant. Don't you think he has the spirit of the Lord too? So why they did not allow to be worshipped? Because they are not Yeshua and they are not God. There were 24 thrones and 24 elders. Now this is very interesting because the vision of Enoch doesn't have this. The vision of Ezekiel doesn't have this. The vision of Isaiah doesn't speak about this. The vision of Daniel doesn't speak about this. So why John? All of a sudden, there was a different group, new setting. There was a change. So heaven changed too. And they are clothed in white and golden crown on, the, on their head. Okay. Now, 24 thrones, 24 elders. There are presbyters. 24 presbyters or 24 elders. Now, they have crowns in their head. Now, in the Bible or in the Brit Kadesha, there are five crowns which are mentioned that will be given to believers. All believers. It's either all or one or two. I don't know how many crowns we're going to be given. But there are five crowns. Incorruptible crown, according to 1 Corinthians 9, 25, 24-25. This is also called imperishable crown. The crown is given to believers who faithfully run the race, who crucify every selfish desire in the flesh and point man to Yeshua. Incorruptible crown. The crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, and Daniel 12, 3. To those who faithfully are witnesses to the saving grace of God that lead and leads souls to Yeshua. This crown has also been named as the soul winner's crown. So those people who lead uh, people to the Lord has a crown. Now, this is, this is what is very interesting. Uh, people are thinking that when you witness to a person, that's your fruit. That's not your fruit. That's not your fruit. You did not make that man. You did not make him believe. And you did not sustain him. It's the Lord's, right? But the effort that we do, we will be rewarded. But the fruit is different. The fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, uh, and self-control, right? So those, those are the fruit. So that's why when, when in Matthew... In, in, in Matthew 25, uh, verse 31 and onward, when we are facing judgment, the Lord will not say, how much theology did you learn? Or how much money did you give? Or how many people did you witness to? That's nothing to do with it. He just separated the two and uh, those in the right hand said, uh, you, you come to my father's uh, glory because you, you fed me when I was hungry. You gave me drink when I was thirsty. You, you clothed me when I was naked. You visited me when I was in prison and when I was uh, uh, sick. And uh, you, you, uh, you let me in when I was a stranger. These are the things. And the Lord has given already the, the answer to the test that is the final test. And still people are not doing it. Also salvation is through good works. No. <laughs> it has nothing to do with, first of all you have to begin with whether he is your Lord or not. Second is whether he is really your Lord by following his commandments. So anyways, you can, you can do all those good things without believing in God, but you cannot, you cannot afford not to do those things if you really believe that he is your Lord. Right? So a crown of rejoicing, the crown of life, James 1, 2, uh, 1, 12, to those believers who endure trials, tribulations, severe suffering, even unto death, this crown is also referred as martyr's crown. The crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4.8, to those who love the appearing of Christ, who anxiously wait and look forward to the day when he will return for his saints, this crown is given to those who have lived a good and righteous life for God while living down here on earth. And the crown of glory, this is the pastor's crown. Well, they claim, I, I'm quoting this from a Christian uh, thing, but I'm talking about the real pastors. Uh, there are a lot of people who fleece the the. the you know, the, uh, the sheep. Instead of feeding them, they get, they get, rather than pay. And um, we are proud in this congregation that uh, the leaders doesn't get anything. 
we give instead. No matter how small we are, we are on the positive. We are on on the green side of of of, uh, <laughs> of the of the what do you call it uh, char uh, chart or wh whatever you call it in uh, accounting. Anyway, um, so this also includes preachers, teachers, missionaries, and all those who teach the word of God in the respective ministry. Now the question now is, those twenty four elders. What crown do they have? <laughs> we don't know, right? From the throne proceeds flashes and lightnings and sounds and peals of thunder. Did you not read this also from the book of Enoch? And the book of Enoch, according to them, were written 300 BCE, and this one were, was written like towards the end of, uh, of the first century. So if, if book of Enoch is wrong, and why is it that they're the same? Unless John is copying him. But if he is right, he can't be right because he is only taking the name of someone else and he's lying already. Anybody who lies doesn't belong to the Lord, right? You can't lie and say that, that you say the truth. So it's either we only claim that the book of Enoch was written by Enoch himself or not believe it at all and just throw it out. But there are things in there that you may want to read. Anyway, I'm just saying. So seven lumps of fire burning. This is the seventh spirit of God, which is also in Revelation 1, 4, and also in Numbers chapter 8, verse 1 to 4. It's like this. It's like the menorah. So, and we know that Yeshua was walking also in the seven candlestick. So it's not like individual like that, but we don't know. It could have been like this, because the menorah, is that's the way God described it to Moses, how to make it. Like, you, know, you have seven branches and one, one stem, right? Um, and the four living, oh, the sea of glass like crystal. We have read this in, in Enoch, right? And the four living creatures. The four living creatures is also uh, living beings in, in the book of Enoch. It's there. Now, the living creatures, the living creatures, living beings, or hayoth, or hayoth, it means to live, are a class of heavenly beings described in Ezekiel's vision of the heavenly chariot in the first and tenth chapters of the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel's vision of the four living creatures in Ezekiel chapter 1 are identified as cherubim in chapter 10, who are God's throne bearers. The concept of cherubim has been known all over the ancient East as a minor guardian deities of temple and palace threshold. Each of Ezekiel's cherubim have four faces. And that of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle, which is very similar to John. However, their human shape appearances set them apart from the griffin like cherubs of Babylonia and Assyria. In their ability to move, Ezekiel cherubim do not need to turn as they front all directions and points of the compass. This description of movement differs from the seraphim in Isaiah's vision, uh, who had an extra set of wings for their ability to fly. So, the cherub of Ezekiel has four faces. One, like a man, like a bull, like a, a, a lion, and like um, uh, an eagle. And they have four wings. And they have hands between their wings. So, and they have wheels. See, they have wheels already during the time. And that wheels has full of eyes. The vision of Isaiah is... The seraphim, but of course he identified as a seraphim, it has six wings. Six wings, it covers the two wings uh, covering the, 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 the head because he cannot afford to see God. It is too bright for him. And another uh, two wings covers the, the, the feet. They, they have to float because they, the Lord is just way too holy for them. Even to the most holy, he is very holy. That's why God killed Nadab and Abihu. He said... I have to be respected as a holy, holy one. Even the angels cannot even touch me. So, and yet, preachers are saying, come as you are. Come as you are. You know, dress whatever you want to dress, just come. The Lord is holy, be careful. <clears throat> and two wings is flying, so four. But in Isaiah, he did not see the shirob. Where are they? But in Ezekiel, he did not see the seraph. Where are they? Oh, they have work. They also work. <laughs> Read Enoch. 
They are there somewhere working. Anyway, in Revelation, what John, what John saw is different. It's similar, but it's different. Why different? He said there are four creatures. So there's always four bodyguards in, in there, right? Always four. What Ezekiel saw are the Sherub, very powerful four-winged uh, beings, four, four, um, four faces. They can go any direction. They don't need to like do anything. They can just go there immediately. They're so fast, right? Very powerful, scary. And the Sherub, uh, the Sherub are like they're flying. And they're they have full of eyes. Well, according, well, we will discuss that uh, shortly. But the living creature of John is kind of a combination of both. Now the, it has six wings, which covers, and it has all eyes, but it has the faces of what uh, Ezekiel saw, except he only mentioned one face each. Unless he was seeing it from a view that everybody's like, you know, like if they have four, right? He can see one like that, one like that, one like that, one like that. We don't know because he's seeing it from a perspective, right? So from a perspective, he can see one face of each. But uh, Ezekiel was more nosy. He was like going around probably, so he was able to see four. But for John, he only saw one face, but six wings. Could this be different? Maybe. We don't know. These are uh, secrets that doesn't belong to us. So we don't know. They could be the same. They could be different. We don't know. But in the book of Enoch, four uh, living beings were mentioned that are four be beside the Lord. They are also called angel of the presence. And did you know that Yeshua is also called angel of the presence? All right. It was mentioned in Isaiah. Anyway, um, if you want to learn that, stick with, uh, with us in, uh, in the book of Enoch and also the book of Isaiah. Anyway, um, so it's different. So the four names were Michael, Gabriel, Penuel, and uh, uh, what's the other name? I forgot. Anyway, so um, uh, not sure. I forgot. Anyway, that's okay. But... There were no names here, right? But the point is, there are always four. Then after that, something. Now, the reason why I want to discuss this, because I want you to remember this when we come to study the beast. Because he is one of this. Anyway, the description parallels of the wheels that are beside the living creatures in Ezekiel 1.18 and 10.12 that are said to be full of eyes all around. The Hebrew word for wheel Apanim was also used in later Jewish literature to indicate a member of the angelic orders. And the term eyes can also be used as a metaphor for stars. And stars are a metaphor for, uh, for angels. So, anyway. Let's discuss with the seraphim. The word seraphim or seraph for singular, seraphim for more, means burning ones or noble. They are also sometimes called the ones of love. Because their name might come from the river root for love. Um, and seraphim uh, are only fully described in the Bible on one occasion. This is in the book of the prophet Isaiah when he is being commissioned by God to be a prophet and he, was, he has a vision of heaven. So these types of heavenly beings have six wings, but they only use two of them for flying. It sounds strange to use wings to cover your face and feet. They may dwell... Uh, they may well cover their face because being so close to God, they would witness His full glory, which would be too powerful to behold. And yet, the Son can see the Father. Right? Um, feet are considered unclean, but they are, they are sinless, right? But still, it's unclean. And so not worthy to be shown to God. Some scholars also think that feet could actually mean genitals, but you know, just that is a speculation. We're not uh, told how many seraphs are there, but it's more than one. So in Isaiah, it was not known how many. He just it was just mentioned plural. So, but based on Ezekiel, 
based on Enoch, based on John, it's always four. So we assume there, there is four. But again, Enoch did not see them. And John, uh, uh, Ezekiel did not see them. Now, uh, their position is flying above God's throne, unlike the cherubim who are beside or around it. Uh, the primary duty is to constantly glorify and praise God, and they may also be a personal attendant, angels of God, their eternal songs. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole, the whole earth is full of His glory. has been used by Jews and Christians for thousands of years to join with the angels in praising God. We have the Kadosh, right? In Hebrew, to use the same word three times to describe something means that one, that the person object is utterly like the word. So calling God holy three times means that God is utterly and perfectly holy. In Jewish folklore and some later Christian works, the seraphim are said to be the highest rank of angels. And this is probably because of their very close proximity to God. So the closer you are, the higher you are. Just imagine the son who is sitting beside the father. <laughs> right? Cherubim. The prophet Ezekiel has a vivid vision of heaven where he sees many angelic beings. His description of the cherubim is powerful, almost frightening. The cherub are also described in the construction of the Ark of the Covenant. And the Bible doesn't say how many cherub there are, cherubim there are, but we're told that Ezekiel saw four. And there may be more than that. Their role is to guard God's holy domain and the presence from any sin and corruption. They are sometimes known as the throne angels, as they are seen to be around the throne of God. And in Jewish folklore, the throne angels are also known as Merkabah. Having four faces on four sides of their heads and being arranged in a square, they can travel in any direction without having to turn. And the word shirub sh may come from a term to guard, uh, which would fit well with their role. And nowhere in the Bible are the cherub actually called angels. So, so that's 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 basically what they're, they're saying. These are the cherub. These are ah, these are the seraphs. These are the uh, cherubim around it. So there are four 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 wings. But <clears throat> here's the thing. I want you to understand the glory of the Lord. It's not like an ordinary thing. It's a vision that is beyond expression. But the writers were allowed to express it in the way they can so that we will understand that the Lord is holy. Amen. That we cannot just come to Him in any way or form we want. We could die. And yet, people are preaching, come as you are. You know, the Lord is full of love. The, why is it the angels cannot even touch down? Why does they have to cover her? Right? He's way too holy. And people are not realizing this. And also, what is to come involves these beings. Because the beast is a very powerful one. And you may want to, to consider, you know, playing around with that person because he is no ordinary uh, creature. It needs as powerful as Yeshua to beat him. Because if someone of his level only, the probability of losing might be, you know, it's equal, right? If it is 50-50, you can't have your, your win. It has to be somebody who is mightier. So you have, you're secured of winning. And the only one that can be sent to beat this guy is Yeshua himself. That's how powerful this guy is. Anyway, uh, I hope and pray that we learn about these things and we put them to our hearts so that we, we fear the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Avino Malkeinu, our Father and our King, we thank you, Lord, for the visions that you have shown to your servants. John, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, even Enoch, oh Lord, we thank you because we have an idea of what is out there. And we don't have to build the Tower of Babel in, in a sense to do and reach that because we know that we are going there through Yeshua HaMashiach. But while we are here, oh Lord,
we pray that we take to heart that you are holy, simple, and that we, we need to be holy just like you are holy. And we pray, Lord, that may you keep your words in our hearts and multiply them so that we will not depart from it. Lord, we praise you, we honor you, even as we thank you for everything that you've given us. And as we give back to you, O Lord, may you bless us and the gifts, and may you use this to propagate your gospel until you come. This we pray in Yeshua's most precious name. Amen.